Hi, I'm Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, interviews with the living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. And this week, I have a very special guest coming to us from Tucson, Arizona. His name is Monk Yun Ro, and he was formerly Arthur Rosenfeld. He received his academic education at Yale, Cornell, and the University of California, and was ordained a Taoist monk in Guangzhou, China. From 2010 to 2013, he famously hosted the hit national public television show Longevity Tai Chi, He's both a gold and silver Nautilus Book Award winner for his Mad Monk Manifesto, which is literally the next book on my shelf to read. He was named the 2011 Tai Chi Master of the Year at the World Congress on Qigong and Traditional Chinese Medicine. And as I mentioned, he most recently published The Monk of Park Avenue, which is probably one of the best books I've read in a long, long time. It's a thrilling to me memoir slash autobiography. I hate genres. And uh, I read it in less than three days. And if I didn't have a one-year-old daughter, I would have read it in a day. Um, it's incredible, it's compelling, and uh, I have a strong feeling that my interview with him is going to be even more strong and compelling because in person he's a very rich and vibrant man. Without further delay, I would like to welcome Monk Yun Ro. Well, thanks very much for having me on. Absolutely. And I connected with you after hearing you on the Duncan Trussell podcast, which is one of my favorite all-time podcasts. And so uh, I immediately wanted to have you on to talk about your near-death experience, your most recent one, as well as other ones you've had. But also, I really want our audience to open up and and hear what you have to offer the world, because I think you have a lot. Uh, I do have a direct question to ask you from the book, because it was a very important passage to me, and it resonated. I'd like you to kind of speak to that if you don't mind. So I'm going to read from your book for you. So many of the tales I'm told by my parents and teachers and what is written in the newspaper seem somehow dubious to me. Nothing before me, not the rules of society, religion, politics, labels, race, social class, work, obligation, discipline, duty, or death, matches the simplicity of Poe's days of devotion and practice and contemplation at the monastery. That resonates so deeply with me because those are not word for word because I'm not as good of a writer as you, but those are the thoughts I've had repeatedly in my life. So I was curious, do you still feel that way today? I think some people are born with a seeking gene. I don't know what it's attached to. I don't know how to predict that you will have a seeking child. I think that's probably not only not possible, but maybe maybe not desirable uh, because it does does create challenges and uh, a frequent sense that you don't belong where you are and that, you know, things are, are not quite right somehow. And so time spent... In practice at the monastery, monasteries, I've been to um, meditation. They're kind of an antidote for the nonsense of the world, which is created by people. So let me just say right up front, there is nothing so shallow as human intelligence. And uh, I've believed this for a long time. I've seen it, known it for a long time. That exact way of putting it, and from a guru of mine in the 1990s. And he, he just put it that way. And I thought, well, I can't improve upon that. So I still borrow it from him. He's sadly long gone. But I, I think about that phrase. In other words, anything that comes out of nature, anything that you see and experience outside your own little cubbyhole, whether it's a mansion or a cardboard box on the street, anything that you see that has been made by people, Anything that you've been told that has been construed or constructed by people can never be particularly true, and it can never be any match for what the natural world has to teach you. So you, you might say, well, that's a bunch of nonsense. What if somebody tells you, don't, don't take another step or you're going to fall to your death? That's the edge of a cliff you're standing on. Well, the cliff is telling you. The drop is telling you. Your eyes are telling you. You're teetering pit in the stomach absence of balance is telling you. But we don't need people to to tell us that unless perhaps we're a toddler. So I I don't want to make statements that are so absolute that contrarians will fix fix a minor detail in order to unhorse the argument. But let's just say that we really absolutely have no idea what we are, who we are, why we're here, what we're doing, none of that. And I don't care if you are at this the Large Hadron Super Collider in CERN, I don't care if you are at Kurzweil's uh, AI lab at MIT, 
Uh, I don't care if you are a Bedouin in the desert, although you're likely to know more than the others. But, but the fact is we, we have, at the time of birth, filters that are part of our brain. These filters have been applied by evolution. Some people uh, consider Tao, that's T-A-O or D-A-O, which is the root of the philosophy I adhere to, to be evolution. Some people consider Tao to be time. But in any case, these filters are there for a purpose. And honestly, they're, they're very important. Uh, we may spend our life trying to s remove them from our sensorium minute by minute, day by day, so that our sense of reality is not limited, narrowed, or obstructed. But they are there for a reason. For example, your eyesight. If you saw all the frequencies of light that arrive through space from the sun, and even distant other celestial bodies, you would go mad. Your brain would be overloaded. You couldn't make out the Empire State Building nor an ant. And perhaps more importantly, you couldn't make out that venomous snake you're about to step on or the poison fruit you're about to eat. So by narrowing our view, we survive whether we survive in order to pass on our codons like Richard Dawkins believes, or whether we survive for some religious, spiritual reasons, which I don't believe. Um, we can talk about religion in due course, but mm -hmm. um, these filters have a purpose. At a certain point in your life, and if you are a certain kind of person, you may come to feel that it is time to remove carefully and purposefully these filters to achieve a deeper understanding and a wider view. Hallucinogens may be helpful in this regard, although the risk of them is that they will <laughs> remove so many filters that you either have a bad trip or you become completely overwhelmed and don't realize or understand in any way what it is you're looking at. So, you know, done properly and, and guided by people who know what they're doing. Um, I, I think those tools are useful. In my tradition, there may have been some of that, you know, in very early days, maybe even Neolithic times, maybe even Paleolithic times, because this is a, Taoism is a very, that's what I'm a monk in. Um, mm -hmm. That is a very old and shamanistic based uh, way of looking at the world. I, I don't know, because, you know, I wasn't there. And I don't know what those guys were doing, sitting in a cave, smoking weed or, or mushrooms or you know, how to, or maybe none of the above. Maybe they just meditated so long and so deeply that the filters were removed by them in a deliberate fashion, which is sort of the approach that I have taken. But in any case, as long as those filters are in place, we cannot, even with the, the web telescope and with all with our electron microscopes and all the rest, we, we cannot see the world the way it really is. And, you know, near-death experiences can be attached to the idea that, you know, at death, filters fall away. I believe that's probably true because other functions go, so why not them? Um, but we were talking about seeking and how long, you know, I've kind of felt this way about things. And I can tell you that as long as I can remember, but certainly not between nine and 12 years old, I started to read uh, Far Eastern scriptures. And of course, I, I had zero comprehension of any of it. And yet there was for the little boy in me or the little boy me, there was a sense that there was something there for me that I was not getting from the upbringing, the Western upbringing I was having, which was a secular Jew in a well-off family in Manhattan. And, and you know, I suppose people have asked me, and I, I have a student who's an Orthodox rabbi, and he, he talks about this with me. And he, he said, well, you know, what if the rabbinate or what if Orthodox Jew or Judaism had been presented to you in a different way 
what if the burden of being a Holocaust survivor, in a Holocaust survivor family had not interfered with your feelings about the religion? Could you have possibly become a rabbi instead of a Taoist monk? And I spread my hands and says, and say, who knows? Maybe, you know. I mean, seekers do pursue all kinds of paths, and I don't really believe that one is any better than the other. All I can say is that, you know, I found a path that very much speaks to me. And what other seekers find and what they cleave to is much of much less interest to me than that they seek it all. And that's that's actually the perfect segue for why I sought you and wanted to speak to you is that I don't seek one truth. I seek the dispelling of truths, which is another thing you just talked about. So I am curious because the two people who resonate with me a lot beside, or I'm sorry, the person besides yourself is he's now deceased, Ram Dass. Um, and I, I see a similarity that you were both uh, raised Jewish uh, with wealth. You're both very well educated and, uh, I'm not going to say you threw away all of that, but, you know, your life led you to where it led you, and, and now you're a monk. So I'm curious, have you ever, did you ever meet him? Have you ever thought about that? Do you, do you hear that a lot? A little surprised to hear you say he's deceased. He's right there in the corner. He's listening, floating up there. <laughs> I, I wave to him sometimes. Um, yeah, very, very interesting guy and, and uh, teacher, I think. But because I pursued a literary life at the outset and actually still. I, I would say that in addition to my Chinese masters, my primary master in particular, but also some others, uh, the abbot who ordained me and other people I've met along the way. In addition to those, I, I've always been very much moved by literature and by what is able to be conveyed in fiction, what truths and insights about the world are able to be conveyed through fiction, which is my chosen medium, as opposed to, you know, how-to books or uh, self-help and that sort of thing. And, and, and I would say that the power of story is so hard why it is, is so great because our brains are hardwired for it. All millions of years ago, when we were flirting with the beginning of the development of language, there was some urge to share. And if you and I were a couple of monkeys sitting in a tree and, you know, I see a python or a leopard coming up behind you, I don't have any way of telling you that. Dude, Mike, you're about to get, you know, the big one is coming here. You're, this, this ain't you. This ain't your day, um, or it is your day, depending on how you view it. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I point or I gesture with my chin or, you know, uh, and I go, boo, 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 boo. And you never heard that boo noise before. You have no idea what that means. And you're sort of curious. And so you look around and, oh, my God, look what's there. And then you jump off the branch just as the leopard leaps on you or the snake strikes or whatever. So from that moment on, Somewhere, sometime in Africa, presumably, proto people, monkeys, not the manic murder monkeys we have become, but just like regular monkeys, came to associate that utterance with snake or leopard or whatever we say. And then, you know, it's a logical step to have a, some monkeys sitting around grooming each other and pulling off ticks. And, you know, one says, boo, boo, boo. And the other one smiles and goes, you know, with his little, all those cake, all those big teeth, and, and and you know the 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 idea that has been conveyed is, hey, thanks for saving my life from that leopard, and now everybody in our little monkey group knows that <laughs> means you know jump, you're about to be eaten by a leopard, or there's a leopard stalking us, or whatever. So you notice that we went from language immediately to story, because from there it's only a very short moment even though it may have been hundreds of thousands of years. But in the progression, it's very brief in terms of the evolution of this planet that people are sitting around going, yeah, you remember the time I, you know, I told you, be careful, there's something about to eat you on the branch, and you jumped in. Yeah, dude, you saved my life. Well, well, we've got to do these things for each other and, and all that. So this is, how it, this is how it works. So uh, all I'm trying to get at is that story is super important um, in helping us apprehend the world. And it reveals more about the filters that I mentioned, 
than almost anything else. That's kind of like the nitty gritty of what the show is trying to get to is, is there a correct or incorrect way to live your life on earth? And as you declared early on, you don't necessarily believe in a religion or a spiritual truth. So I'm curious, is there incorrect and correct behavior with morality? So not, I'm not talking about should you or should you not like smoke cigarettes? I mean more about like treating other people the way you treat them and everything. Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks. So, you know, morality is, is a human construct. I, I don't believe that there's a God or, uh, or a Moses or a Jesus or any of that stuff, because those are storybooks. They're very nice stories. They have good points to them. Some of the teachings are fantastic, but there's no more Jesus than there is Thor. You can go to the you can go to the movie theater and enjoy Chris Hemsworth the show in his chest, the God of Thunder, and that doesn't get you confused between you know Chris playing a mythical character um, the way that uh, Christian or Abrahamic people, let's say in general, can get a bit lost in the intricacies and power of myths and legends. This connects oddly enough to me to when you were on Duncan's podcast, you were speaking about insects. And that was actually another weird common trait that we have, which is I never liked insects or reptiles. and I never wanted to be anywhere near them, but I've always like respected their life. I don't like killing spiders. I don't like killing them at all. Um, and neither does my wife. And it's, um, it's cool. Like we'll take them and put them outside. So I'm, I'm curious is, uh, is your relationship to the to the insect world different from your relationship to humans, or is it the same? Dude, that was eighteen questions in one. Let me try. <laughs> let, 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 me, let me try. Okay, uh, I'll see what I can do with it. All right. Uh, are you familiar with the Zuni tribe of Native Americans? I don't think so. They're, they're here in Arizona and in New Mexico. I think they carve stone to represent animals in their environment. Now their enterprise has become one, that has become a commercial enterprise. But it used to be that a shaman would carve uh, a stone creature for you according to what he saw that you needed as a companion or protector. And that there was no transactional dimension to this. You, you, you couldn't buy it in a souvenir shop in Santa Fe Airport. You know, it, it was um, Those things are beautiful, and I have some, actually, a shelf full of them <clears throat> behind me. In fact, I got a few shelves full of them. But they're, they're just like really beautiful carvings. But the original idea was that, you know, they represented you and your relationship with nature. They could be a medium, they could be a guide, they could be a protector. The reason I mention them in connection to your question about bugs and reptiles and all that is that in the Zuni worldview, on which I am far from an expert, but this much I have been told, the more primitive the animal, the further down, let's say, the evolutionary ladder, uh, let's say comparing a scorpion to a bear, the scorpion is the far more powerful entity than the bear. And, you know, you might look at that assertion and say, what are you talking about? The bear just swat that thing, you know, to Hong Kong from here, uh, squash it. it, got stung, didn't really notice much. Um, I mean, you know, but the power of that bug, that tortoise, that snake is in it's obedience and clear relationship to natural law and phenomena. So, you know, there's a famous uh, Chinese parable about a frog and a scorpion. The scorpion says, hey, you know, these floodwaters are rising. I really, I really need to, can, hey, dude, can you just, like, can you carry me on your back and take me over the other side of the pond there because I'm going to drown. I'm not a swimmer. You know, actually, scorpions can survive quite a while underwater, but that's not the point. And, um, so, you know, the scorpion jumps on the frog's back and the frog starts swimming and halfway across the pond. The, st the scorpion stings the frog who begins to succumb to his venom and says, what, what, the, what the heck was that? Why'd you do that? I'm, I'm saving your life here. And the scorpion, you know, replies, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just my nature, right? So, so that concept 
of being obedient to nature, to your nature, to nature with a capital N, is woven into this uh, Zuni uh, idea. And there may be other tribes. I'm, I'm not that familiar with Native American stuff, um, although I recognize that it, it all began in Asia because that's where those books came from originally. In any case, Taoism has a little bit subtly different view. Um, and it, it is subtle in some ways, that difference. I don't look with pity at the mosquito inserting its little proboscis into my capillary and say, you know, you, you poor little fella, you just need, you know, you just need a drink and, <laughs> you know, it's not going to bother me that much and scratch on just so long as you don't give me, you know, Zika or something, I, you know, whatever. So please don't do that, but go ahead and have a drink. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not so much that. Rather, it's that I've, through practice and through some of the experiences you asked me about at the beginning, I don't want to use the word achieved because that makes me out to, to be something special, which I'm not. It's just that at some point, so many of those filters were stripped away, a lot of them without my knowing or wanting that because the, you know, the consequences of that stripping were so dire so miserable and so painful that I, I wouldn't be honest if I said, you know, I, I really made that deal, you know, because frankly, if, if there was a deal to be made about some of the things that I've gone through, particularly in the last couple of years, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a pussy. You know, I, I, I just say, well, yeah, uh, if, if some mythical sage, you know, appeared as I was on the thousandth step of my climb to the top of the temple where I would be a fully realized monk and all that. And he said, look, hey, great dude, you did a thousand steps. You can really see a lot from here. It's, you like the view? And I'm like, yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, I've been working on it a while. And he says, you know, you only got eight steps left, but then, and then you're there, you know, a thousand and eight. And I'm just making stuff up here, but just giving you a metaphor for this. And he says, oh, I said, oh that's great. Eight, only eight left. He says, yeah, yeah, but, you know, those last days are going to feature pain and suffering and misery that you literally don't have the mind to comprehend at this moment. You cannot believe how bad it will be. And unless you've been shot in half on the battlefield and are conscious for two seconds before, and, and when there's two pieces of you, uh, and you're about to exsanguinate and have a moment or two left of consciousness, you can't even imagine the suffering. And in that case, you'd be in shock, so you wouldn't really feel anything, and then you'd be dead. So you know, the, the, some of the stuff that has happened to me of late has made me realize this thing that, you know, about those last eight steps. <laughs> or we could do a little do-over, you know. <laughs> you don't have to do those eight. You could just stay here with the thousand. And I would leap on it, right? I'm not, I'm not the macho monk. I, I wish I bring it on baby kind of guy, you know, I, which I, w I would like to be able to say I am. I don't know that such people really exist in, in real experience, but maybe they do. And I wish I were one, but I'm not. So what I can say is that as the result of some of that stuff lately, my worldview has coalesced pretty much constantly into something that I only achieved. And there I can say achieved, achieved working on it in hours of standing meditation in Taoist uh, style, and I would get a glimpse. I mean, it wouldn't even go on a minute. It would just be a glimpse of this matrix of interconnectedness that brings everything together. And once you see that, then the mosquito, not being the poor little guy trying to make a living, although there is that, but rather that the mosquito is you, that you are both part of this matrix of energy, matter, time, which is a whole other subject because it's not what we think. It's not a river going, flowing anywhere. It doesn't even exist except in the human construct. Um, all, all are present at all times. But um, you, you reach down to squish the bug. And, and I have to plead you know, my own limitations and imperfections here because I have been known 
to squash a cockroach at night in the bathroom, <laughs> right? Um, either inadvertently or just to be half asleep and, you know, like, oh, you know, if I let you live, there's going to be a thousand more of you in a week, you know. Um, but most most of the time, the great majority of the time, and I, I'm vegan, <clears throat> it's not really some high-mindedness or principle that leads me to these things, but rather just the awareness that we are of the same substance. We are motivated like a glove by some kind of celestial hand that slips into us and has us walking around doing our little silly monkey and row dance. And then, you know, the hand withdraws and whatever I am or was recedes back into the fabric. And so it is with the mosquito. So, you know, the moment either of us are gone and even while we're alive, we're still part of that same fabric. Now, this is a very difficult way of being and seeing and living to explain. It's very hard. It's like when somebody tries to describe an LSD trip to you and the minute they start talking about it, they realize that what they experienced is very poorly represented by the words they're using to speak it to you. And so it is here. I have no idea how to explain this better than any, than the way I just have, which is sort of the, my default um, description because it's just so much more and it involves so many senses and not so much language. Um, and so when you ask me about correct, we finally, uh, <laughs> And you circle back to um, like a jazz riff in a club, like Rubeck playing Take Five, and he goes so far away from the from the melody that everybody he, he knows he's such a genius that he senses when everybody in the club starts to get restless, like you know Dave's gone off it, and all of a sudden, bum bum bum, bum bum bum, bum appears and the whole place just stands up screaming, right? So so <laughs> there, there's um. <laughs> There's a feeling that uh, if you see this clearly, if you have removed enough of those filters, then there is a way to live and a way to behave that is obvious to anyone who has achieved that. And it's not, to say correct or incorrect implies a judgment and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, when it comes to religion and, you know, my... Perhaps, you know, people could construe what I said a few minutes ago about, you know, the little stone god as disparaging. Um, what, what I'm really getting to, and what started out as a comment about story and fiction, is that there is a way to, at least with our meager mental equipment, at least with our filtered sensorium, at least with our deeply flawed characters, our you know murder manic murder monkeys that that we are and our inherent destructiveness and desire to obliterate everything that we see from each other to the rest of the planet and all the sentient beings here we're just destroyers so there there is a way to not behave that way when you see and understand things a little differently and i guess i'm sorry to be long-winded on this point but there's one, one more aspect oh, that, I, that I think is important. When we look for solutions to the things we have done and are doing to the world and to each other, looking to more technology, which is an egoic manifestation of our own greed and desire to control and ultimately destroy, all we get is more of the same. We may appear to have a solution to one thing, but things are so intricate in the natural world that you mess with one thing and time after time you discover that you screwed up everything else. So what, what has to happen, and I have felt this and seen this clearly for decades now, is that we have to have a spontaneous piece of evolution. And is it, you know, like, my, like Dr. Andrew Wild talks about, maybe it's hallucinogens, you know, maybe we get, we just, you know, put LSD in everybody's water and then they stop killing each other. You know. I, I, I can't, I'm not a drug expert, I can't, I can't speak to that kind of thing. What I can say is 
that in some fashion or other, in the same way that we grew a thumb and started to walk upright and came out of the trees and surveyed the savannah and could walk for 25 or 30 miles, and we could outrun a cheetah, not in a short burst, but getting A to B, if B was 25 miles away, we would get there first because the cheetah is not built for that kind of endurance. It's built for a drag race. Right? So we had all these evolutionary changes and what we need that, that came about as a result of pressures and the plasticity of our genome. If we're going to survive this one, and by we, I don't just mean the manic murder monkeys, which are you know, sort of like a, a cancer growing on the planet now. Um, fits, fits the definition well, I'm afraid. Um, but instead, we want to continue in a way that is laudable in a way that is not um, AI, that is organic life, that is nurturing and compassionate and frugal and humble and helpful and sensitive to each other and all living things. And we have to have what I suppose has to be some kind of spiritual revolution. Something has to change in our brain. We may have to be brought to the brink by nuclear Armageddon. God, I hope not. But, mm -hmm. but you know, there will have to be some powerful force that will change the way we see ourselves and each other. And that solution is, in my view, uh, and it's only my view, uh, the, the, the one that is most likely to succeed as opposed to becoming a conduit or a stepping stone in the evolution toward super AI. And then we become completely irrelevant. You know? I mean, I definitely share those sentiments as far as like, I've, I thought COVID might be that signal for our culture because it was going to kill travel in a certain way, which I, I love to travel, but I'm all about, you know, less jet fuel in the skies and things like that. But, um, but that kind of segues into how I still feel, which I want to read one more passage from your book. And I promise this is the last one. Um, but it was, this was the, the thing that got me because I want to ask you directly if you have an answer to this <laughs> and it's okay if you don't, but, um, so you wrote, this is from your past. Um, I find myself thinking a great deal about fate, karma, heaven, hell, and Tao. More than that, I recognize a streak within myself that hasn't been so clear to me before, although I've sensed it. I don't really want to be in this world. I want to float above it and use it as an object lesson for bigger things. I don't really want to engage fully with anything other than the path to being Master Poe. All else is a distraction. Replace Master Poe with just peace, whatever enlightenment means to you. I don't, I hate that term, but I, I, that's my opinion about all that. And I'm still very much stuck in that. So have you moved beyond that? And do you have advice for people like me and former you? Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember writing that. Uh, well, yes. So, so here's maybe a little bit different way of expressing that. I, I do think that there, I haven't talked about this in a podcast before, but it just comes up for me right now. I do think that there are sort of life lovers and death lovers and that we're born with a certain selection. And, you know, a psychiatrist listening to this would say, you know, they're depressives and non-depressives. You know, people whose neurotransmitters are well balanced and functioning properly and those that are a bit off. I, I'm not talking here about mental illness. You know, I, I don't walk around each day wondering if I should blow my head off. This, this is not the... Uh, the substance of those words. Rather, being concerned with the elevation of the spirit and the removal of filters so that the truth about how nature works can be clearly appreciated is to me, again, this is a personal thing. I can't say about this for anybody else. For me, a much more compelling proposition than getting the corner office, driving the Ferrari, having the supermodel wife, which I should add, I, I have a, a pretty supermodelish wife, so um, she, will, she will eventually listen to this at some point, so I have to make that clear. Um, <laughs> but, but and I'm in a branch of Taoism that, that allows one to marry, not all do. Um, in any case, uh, I just think that the material hyper-focus, the greed, the narcissism, the idea that we are entitled to anything, the idea that an imagined deity, which we made up, who has no more reality than the theater Thor, 
has given us this planet and all the rest of the universe that we can conquer with our spaceships and all. All of it is for us. We can use it as a toilet. We can use it as a bombing range. We, we can destroy all sentient beings at will because after all, they are only here for our pleasure and to serve us. This is where I run into big trouble with Western organized religion. I don't care what people, you know, p people's fantasies about somebody sitting in the clouds uh, watching them all day saying, Mike, don't touch your peepee -pee again. That's the second time today, right? I, 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 don't, I don't have any, what people have in their heads uh, is not my business, right? It's not my business. I don't want them in my head. I don't want to be in their head. I want to control them. I, I got nothing to say about any of that. They want to believe things brilliant. The problem is that when those beliefs lead us to, you know, you, you don't believe in Allah or in some other thing that we believe in. And unfortunately, because that's the case, we have to kill you and your family, right? Okay, when your beliefs mean that you really are actually daily, minute by minute, destroying planet Earth because of some bizarre self-serving fantasy for your ego, your desire to control, to have, to be the boss, for it all to be about you. That's when I run into trouble with religion. And it's usually, you know, fundamentalist. It's not mainstream religion in, in, in any part of the world. These are, you know, sects that are unfortunately now rising to the fore in our country and controlling things in a way that is just, you know, unspeakably appalling and completely mad. That's the problem that I face is that I, that makes me want to just completely disconnect. I have, I have no suicidal tendencies whatsoever. I have a wife who I love who's also a supermodel. And, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I have a beautiful daughter and I have a son um, from a different marriage who I love very much. And uh, so I have no desire to escape or leave these people. But uh, I do, as I look at finances and my necessity to pay for my stake, for my home, for my family – you know, I have to put that at odds with, well, that means I'm contributing to the very system that appalls me. And so that makes me want to escape and leave or find a faith, which is, I love that the, the theme of this podcast to me is, is faith is actually getting us further and further away from what we probably all seek. And that's a very contradictory thought to, I think, what I was raised to believe and often thought until my mid thirties when um, something really terrible happened to me and that kind of woke me up. And so, uh, you, you have this phrase, it's brilliant. I, I wish I could steal it as a writer and use it, but I'm, I'm so enamored by this phrase. You talk about disinhibiting behavior, and it's the most powerful phrase to me because it, it, to me it summarizes and sums up what's going on. So is that, am I, am I correct in understanding you that that's part of your perception as well, that this disinhibiting behavior is run amok and we're now the, the murder monkeys? All of this comes back to indulging our negative emotions. And the term negative, as, as soon as I speak these words, I find myself on thin ice that cracks, you know, if I drop a marble, it'll crack, right? Because good and evil are also constructs. Our morality is a construct. If you really want to get to the nitty gritty of Taoist thought, you have to cultivate the ability to see cycles, to see change as the only constant, to see how forces interact with each other in the world at all times, how nothing is static or stable or black and white or absolute, and how you have to learn over time to live a life that Taoists describe as Wu Wei, or living Wu Wei, which is Wei Wu Wei, which means that you are acting in accordance with the forces of the universe, and that you are using as little energy as possible, and you are making the most important contributions and the biggest contributions you can make without forcing, without exhausting yourself, without hurting anybody and adhering to the, what we call the three treasures of compassion, frugality, and humility. You know, you mentioned making a living. Um, 
Well, I, I should acknowledge at the start that uh, I may not be the smartest guy in the room, but I'm not an idiot. So only an idiot becomes a Taoist monk to become a rich man. <laughs> you know, this is not, that, that would not be the choice. But the, the question is, like, why do you want to be a rich man? Why do you want such complication and abundance that your life is then run and ruled by your stuff, by the people who you can no longer trust because they want things from you and you don't know whether they're lying, whether their feelings for you are real, whether artifice abounds in every corner of your life because everybody has an agenda, right? So, right? So, so as soon as you start going in any of these extremes away from, well, let's just for this moment stay with the three treasures, you end up not only damaging your world with your own idea that it's all about me and my narcissistic entitled behavior, which is such a sad thing to see going on in, in young people these days. Not all young people. I see a lot of great ones too, but a lot of them. Um, and, and maybe worst of all, although because it's not about you, this is not really the worst part of it, but it also messes up your own life, it makes your life suck. You know, so, so when you ask me, you know, how to live correctly, you know, that, that is the substance and focus of a number of great Taoist texts, the Lao Tzu being one, um, mm. which is just an examination of the natural phenomena outlined in a very early, perhaps as early as, I don't know, Paleolithic or Neolithic times, examination of how things worked, work in nature. And then that, that book is called the Book of Change, the Yi Jing. And, and, and the Tao Te Ching was sometimes called the Lao Tzu for the, the putative author who probably didn't exist. Uh, well, you know, it was probably a tea clatch of God because Chinese uh, culture is very big on ancestor worship. And if you say that this came from the old master, not from you, you imbue it with greater authority and gravitas, right? So whether Lao Tzu was or was not a real person is as entirely beside the point as whether Jesus was or wasn't a real person. People get hung up on the historicity at the expense of the message, in, in my own personal view, lost, or in a Taoist view, lost. So we can say that there is a way to live. And I, I found that Taoist teachings help me personally, and my students and followers around the world, readers, to discover effectiveness, ease, lack of conflict, deeper emotional connections with other humans and the rest of the sentient world. And I think that's about as ambitious as I can be. You know, that's the way I try to live. And, you, you know, I live in a nice house. You know, people come to see me and they say, wow, Sifu, you really live in a beautiful place. And, and it, it's, you know, I have a great view and I'm in the Tucson mountains and I go outside all the time and look around and I can see five or six different mountain ranges and the, and the spread of the city beneath me. I mean, it's, it's not like I'm in a cave with, you know, with nails in my feet, uh, or open sores on my legs and, and arms telling me these things because I won't eat anything but a dead mushroom. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. But there, there is a way, and it has harmony and balance and compassion and these other things, has its features, its guiding ideas. And whether they are more moral or are better values than than everything else that we are surrounded with is not my place to say. What I can say is that they work for me and that they inherently damage less and support more and deepen your life. And so on that note, uh, in your opinion, what is the source of intuition? The feminine. Western culture over relies greatly on the young. The male, the bright, the strong, the fast, the hard, the bright side of the mountain originally. And what a lot of Taoist texts are about 
is re-establishing balance between that yang and yin, which is the soft, the feminine, the mysterious, the moist, the quiet, the intuitive. And so when our brains are overly driven by our material desires and compulsions and behaviors, and when we see everything in a mechanical way, absent any energetic or spiritual dimension, we get horribly, tragically lost, which is exactly where we are now. And there's, you know, there are people who describe this balance between yin, you know, the soft and yang, the heart, which is an ever-changing, constantly interchanging process. It's a movie, not a still. But there are people who describe that process as what is happening or has happened globally with the West being too young, too rational, too intellectual, too material, and the yin being the East. Now, you know, the truth is that things are being globalized in such, in such a way that that distinction, you know, Chinese have become hyper-capitalistic, like caricatures of what we, we want. Um, you know, the idea that, that capitalism is a good thing because you're going to be free and have everything you want if you just work hard and... Um, that's ridiculous. Why should everybody have everything they want? How can you possibly sustain a world like that? How can you have a, a half a billion dollar yacht armed to the teeth for the pirates that will attempt to assault it when you know doomsday comes and the rich family huddles within, hoping that the people that, they're, that are working for them don't turn on them, while at the same time, Bangladesh is underwater? You know, this represents an enormous imbalance. And Taoism is harmony and, and balance. And so it's not that in its germ phase, capitalism is bad any more than communism is bad, even though we've never seen communism on the face of the earth. It's just an idea in, a, in the book of a German intellectual. You know, there's no communism in Russia. There's no communism in Cuba. There's no communism in China. That's just a banner they wave to make the poor people feel good. It's not, it's not. Um, the idea that these germ state ideas are, are good or bad has really got nothing to do with where we are now because everything is run amok. There is no balance. And if Taoism teaches anything is that the universe will rebalance mm -hmm. and it won't rebalance in a way we like if, if, um, if we're looking at it honestly right now. So unless that evolutionary piece that I mentioned earlier comes into play and some third door emerges that's not, you know, conflict and not yielding, then uh, we're, we're not, we're not going to like where things are going. And we have to try really hard to become part of the balancing and the bringing of harmony. Because if we continue on the current path, none of that will be available. And I think that's the perfect note to switch gears to kind of the purpose of Coffin Talk, which is a show to talk about death and your near-death experience, which in my opinion, the most recent one, which is an addendum to your beautiful memoir, um, autobiography. I hate the term memoir, but I know you refer to it as one. So I'm trying to be respectful of that, but I, I consider it an autobiography and an excellent one at that. But in the end, you mentioned that, I, I believe it was during COVID, you got something that's locally very famous here called Valley Fever, except you got the rarest, and I'm going to let you explain this yourself in your own words, but at one point you had a near-death experience that, and again, it has to do with what you mentioned about time. It was almost like timeless within this universe, but full of time where you were. And I feel like that you came back and I'm curious if that balanced you because that was the last thing we talked about. That's why I thought this was sort of eerily similar to what you were just talking about. Do you feel like that was a balancing in your life or do you feel like that was the 1000 first step? Like how, how are you relating to your own experience? And then also please share the experience whenever it seems appropriate. Yes. So quote, Valley fever is a well-known fungal disease. It's a Coccidiomycosis lives in the ground here in southern Arizona, Arizona actually all over, I think, and also in places in California. There were some cases reported in Oregon. The uh, fungal diseases um, are a feature of global warming. What I, should, what I should say more specifically, more correctly, is that these fungi have been around for billions of years. They're one of the earliest and most interesting organisms to show up on the planet. And we could have 10 more episodes about what's fascinating about, fascinating about fun, uh, fun, fungi. But because of global warming, a lot of these organisms are either rising to the surface 
in places that are being inundated that have been dry. They are either being scoured in, in from by by winds on the on the landscape that unearth them, you know, take off layers of soil and then they're in the topsoil and you walk or you dig, you construct something, you you know, you dig a pool or you I don't know, a house or you make a road and these things come up. Or, you know, there could be a big storm. But there's a really a lot of ways that you can contract these diseases. And they are not just in the southwestern United States. Coccidiomycosis is, is the one here, but there are other ones in Southeast Asia, Africa, uh, Central and South America, and so on. So more people getting them and more suffering because of them is a, is a not very often discussed feature that can probably be clearly linked to the changing climate. Anyway, my own experience is just, you know, a piece of bad luck, really, as far as we can tell from a medical point of view. Um, a very small percentage of people, well, so let's say a, a minority of people who contract this disease, it disseminates in their body. So it could go to their skin, their lungs, uh, liver, heart, kidneys, and so on. And that can be treated, you know, with antifungal medications, which are, I assure you, no picnic but, but they mostly work either to stop it or uh, eliminate it in the body to make it clinically non-significant. Uh, in the rare, rare case, it goes into the brain, which is what happened to me, and that's not a good prognosis. Anyway, um, I, I had uh, a bad time. I have had a bad time with it, and it's gone to pretty much every organ I mentioned in me, which has just reduced me to a... a shadow of my former physical self, 50 pounds down and so on. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of a martial arts bruiser and, you know, all, all that's kind of gone now. Anyway, uh, my, my, what remains of my battered and destroyed male ego still, you know, bruised that I, I, I can't pick up a heavy suitcase or anything, you know, uh, much less go out and wield a, a halberd or an 11 foot spear as I was wont to do with great relish before all this. Um, and, and to teach those things, which is my greatest pleasure. Uh, in any case, how to view such an occurrence? Is it a, a spiritual lesson orchestrated by a divinity? Um, I, I think probably not. I, I don't see the world that way as we have been talking about. Is it a balancing of excesses or deficiencies in me? to bring me back to a, being a more har harmonious monk and person and being, you know, I think I would like to think so. The, the other option is it's just random bad luck. And, and so the cause or the agent of such events and change, are, are, you, you could say a lot about this if you view it as just walking down the street in Manhattan and a piano falls out of a window and squashes you. Or a bus comes onto the sidewalk because the driver had a heart attack and unfortunately you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, we can get way down this rabbit hole. And I think that it's not that fruitful. I think it's more fruitful to ask, what do you do with it? How do you choose to view it? And what do you do with it? And for me, you know, it has doubt doubtless made me a better monk. You know, it's those last eight steps. You mentioned that you don't like the word... Um, Enlightenment, well, that's good, because enlightenment is not a word from any of these traditions. It's applied to Buddhists a lot, but it was applied to them by Europeans, you know, hundreds of years ago, not we're watching them, not, not by Buddhists. And we don't have it at all in Taoism. We have a very specific energetic uh, process that we pursue, which results in the, the you know, the opening of, of Bai Hui, your crown point, and you connecting energetically with heaven, which doesn't mean the the Abrahamic heaven, but it means something else. Uh, and your connection to, to the ground so that you are suspended like all humans between heaven and earth. And the opening of, of that, that channel and um, the achievement of that view can and is typically done by, if, if it is achieved at all, which is rare, rare, rare. But it, it's the result of, you know, decades of, of practice, much of it very difficult. In Kung Fu, there's a word, ku, so the, the taste of, of Kung Fu, which we could say is also the taste of some of these 
you know, physical pursuits that lead to spiritual results. And the word means bitter. You know, it's, it's bitter. Right? It's not easy or fun, right? So, so I, I would say that I have chosen to view this as sharpening my sense of what is real and what is not real. Um, like, like the Thor, you know, when you lose the ability to discriminate between fantasies made by humans and phenomena of nature, you are not in a good place. And this describes most of Western of the Western world, and certainly most of the United States, I, I regret to say. So we are all involved in this imbroglio of, of power and ego and uh, narcissism and control and these things which just have to be abandoned because as long as we suffer with them, we, we can't get where we need to be in the world. So, you know, I, I, I did go physically through a lot as this disease ran through my body and went into my heart and my lungs and my kidneys and my bladder, and on and on, many surgeries and so on, and a great, great deal of pain, so much so that there were indeed months where I would lie fetal on the bathroom floor wishing to be dead, right? Not because I was born a death lover, but because it just wasn't worth it. And, you know, you, you have to be there to understand that emotion. It's easy to judge it. Um, but that kind of suffering, which was not being properly controlled in my case, uh, we can lead you to that place. Uh, a long time ago, I wrote a book called The Truth About Chronic Pain. And it explored, you know, the prejudices that people have about people who are suffering. And there's this dismissive disintegration, disconnection. From those people, they are they, and I am me, and me and shall meet, which is really tragic because what those folks who are suffering, especially really badly physically, is a combination of competence and compassion, two wings of the same bird, to help them, make them feel validated. I see you. I understand your suffering. I'm not dismissing you. I recognize you, and I'm here to try to help you. And whether that is a loved one, a family member, a doctor, whatever. Um, that, that is what is needed for, for suffering people. So I had wonderful care, and my wife took great care of me during this time, but it was a really a transcendent level of, of pain. So, you know, at one point, um, my body just stopped. And uh, whether for better or worse, I was revived by paramedics. So, and, and I began, you know, a very long and very painful road to recovery, which, you know, tonight I go and, and teach Tai Chi at a little Church, but you know, during that time I was being carried to the commode and and wasn't able to sit up, stand up, get out of bed, or walk at all. And so, having been you know, if not a master of my own lights, then a very serious devotee of something as sublime and intricate as Tai Chi, I was now rendered unable to put one foot in front of the other. So there are all kinds of levels on which my life was kind of destroyed, the life that I had relied on and come to use to feel comfortable about myself and how I spent my day. Everything, everything was ripped away. So I, I choose to regard that as an opportunity to fix what was out of balance and come back in a more harmonious way as a better and more effective monk, teacher, writer, uh, because otherwise it's just a bum rap. And I think when you related the experience in the book, which again, it's very short and it's at the end, but you know, you mentioned, well, that's my dog's turn to talk. Um, when you mentioned this experience where you were, um, by our definition deceased and then you were revived, but you said the experience lasted far longer than the relative time on earth, which is pretty much what almost every near death experience person survivor. I don't know what the term is for you people. Um, something special that I have not heard. Um, but when you come back, you're filled with the memory of, of where you were. And so I, you can speak, uh, a little bit about it or a lot, but I, I did have a weird question to ask you, which is you said there's part of it you'll never share. And I deeply respect that. What I would like to know is, the reason you will never share it, if that's also not private? Uh, it's the reason is very straightforward. I, I had the very clear sense. I was 
I don't know if coma is the correct medical definition, but I was, you know, unresponsive and had tubes and needles and everything and all kinds of drugs in me during this time. And I had what, I, I just don't know a better word than to say a vision. So Hawaiian spiritualist friends of mine with whom I have discussed this, in their tradition, you know, this is clearly a vision. Taoism has all kinds of examples of teachers or sort of adepts who had a vision that changed everything and then they founded a new sect, uh, had different precepts and so on. The history of Taoism and how it evolved over time into the permeable global movement that it is now is rife with, with examples of this. In any case, I don't know what else to call it. If I came up with a better word, I'd be happy, but that's what it is. Um, but the, the striking thing, and when I, as I get ready to say these words, I realized that in the Taoist tradition, this is not so striking. There was is almost always the format, if you will, for this kind of experience, at least as it is described later by other people posthumously. You know, it's kind of like if we allow for the sake of speculation, the historicity of Jesus, and we say, look, Jesus Christ was, you know, a, a shaman and a mystic who popped his cork and was able to have experiences and just wanted to share them, but was immediately stymied by the barriers of language and the fact that other people's brains don't work that way. And so what was built up around his words, um, you know, I, I don't see that it exactly happened this way, but this is a very typical thing to happen in any religion with any prophet or mystic or sage, is that people who want to ally themselves with that person and that idea and those ideas and those teachings create a structure for it. So sooner or later, we've got a church and we've got people getting paid and we've got people keeping money and you can't marry because you can't give any of that money that comes into the church uh, to anyone else. It has to stay in the church. So when you die, you can't give it to your kids. You have to give it to the church. This is the way the church gets rich. I mean, th 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 I don't want to bash the church because this is a very common thing. It, it happens in many, many religious traditions because it's a social phenomenon which has nothing to do whatsoever with the original mystical experience. Why? Not because everybody around it is bad or greedy or evil. Sometimes there are those people, but because the experience itself cannot be shared. It, it just words don't work. So you immediately have this gulf, which I encounter at this moment, standing at the edge of this abyss, trying to, to tell you what that was. And, 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 and you know, I, I am a wordsmith and I do like story and I've made this kind of thing my life. So I'm as adept at doing this as, as most people, but while I do it, I'm still aware that it's not the thing, you know? So uh, in, in, in Zen in Buddhism, you know, there's some examples of saying, well, look, if Bruce Lee, you know, pointing at the moon, right? The word moon ain't the moon. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's just it. That ain't the word, the four letter word moon is not that celestial orb. We're just making a stand in and Lao Tzu begins his most famous marvelous text with like a, the Tao that I can speak of is, is not, is not the Tao. It's not the real thing. It's not the eternal thing. The word moon is not the moon. I'm just doing the best I can because this is the limitation of language. Right. So, uh, I had the sense during this vision, and I only realized this much later, and I know that sounds really strange, but I only realized the context of the Taoist vision that I just mentioned, like all people in the Taoist tradition who have had visions have always described them as being, as seeing the Jade Emperor or, or Lao Tzu comes down as a deity and guides them. I, I wish I could tell you that the Buddha or Lao Tzu or Zhuangzi 
or Duke of Wen, or, or you know, some of the, one of these guys came down and said, uh, Yun Ro, Soft Cloud, that's what my name means. Soft Cloud, I got some stuff to show you. Right? I would love to tell you that. And, you know, after I'm gone, people will, if anybody still, you know, hears or reads me and they, they, they want to, you know, ramp it up a little bit, they'll say, oh, you know, Loudzo came to me. No, no. <laughs> right? No. I, I want to tell you yes, but in fact, no. What I did get was a sense that there was a curator. And I used the word curator because it was kind of like if you're a big donor to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and you go for a visit, you know, you don't stand in line if you gave 10 million bucks, right? And, and, and you know, or a hundred million bucks these days. Um, or a wing, say, right? You, you don't stand in line with everybody else, uh, you know, outside on the steps waiting to get in, uh, you know, in, in a 90 degree and 90% humidity New York City day, right? That doesn't happen, right? So, so if, you're, if you're someone in particular to the museum, then, you know, the, the vice president of, of collections or whatever, I don't know the, those people, but, you know, you know, that takes you by the hand and says, you know, Monk, it's so nice to have you here. Let me show you some special stuff. Let me make maximize your time and experience and help you get a deep understanding of your visit to this amazing museum. Right? So I, I had this, I call this presence um, a curator because I had the sense, although I never saw this entity, person, energy, there was no nothing but a, but a idea that someone was guiding it, guiding me and that they were choosing I'm on very thin ice when I say they, right? I just don't, I'm acutely aware of the limitations of the language at my disposal. They showed me stuff. I zoomed around the galaxies. I saw comets whizzing by and planets and stars and black holes. And I saw a lot of amazing things, phenomena, change, just incredible. And this went on for what was objectively to outsiders a few days, but, you know, I don't know. And, and look, is it possible that this whole thing took three minutes out of the four days I was unconscious? How the hell would I know? What can I tell you about that? I could tell you that the subconscious or the, uh, it's not the word I want, the subjective opinion of feeling was that it was a protracted experience. And again, you know, there's a lot of NDEs where people sit there and they were only at for three seconds, you know, and they felt like they lived a lifetime. So I, I don't, I, I can't say anything about that. But anyway, it felt like a very intricate and long thing. And I, this, I, I can't uh, give you all of it because it's just too much. At the end, I was shown what's in store for humanity and planet Earth. And that I got so agitated by being shown that that I actually woke up at that point. Now, did I wake up because I was also being injected with stimulants and they were trying to wake me up, you know, at the same time? I don't know. Can't tell you. Because um, I, I, I didn't see what they were doing at that moment because I wasn't there. Um, we could assume that they were doing that kind of stuff uh, and that it was closer to when I woke up than when I didn't. But, I don't, I, I, you know, I can't assert these things with certainty. What I can tell you is that what I was shown was upsetting to me. And later afterwards, I rued that I had pushed, right, that I had pushed back against what I was being shown. And that was the only time I got a voice. The rest of the time it was just, you know, the curator taking me by the arm and taking me from gallery to gallery. And there was such wonder and fascination that talking was not on the table. No need. Much too awesome. All film. So it would be inappropriate to say something like, you know, curator, you got you got come on your shoe. Or, you know, I, I really like that 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 girl on that uh, on that scroll, that painting. Oh, what a sexy girl. You know, it, it wouldn't none of that would occur. It would not only be grossly inappropriate, but it wouldn't even arise. And, and then when I saw, you know, what becomes of us, and I, I said, no, 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 you know, I, I, don't, I don't want this at all. I don't like this at all. This can't be right. This can't. And there's got to be a way to avoid this. You know, 
then I heard the voice saying, you know, in a sort of a tough love way, sorry, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It's not about you. And that, that was more or less when I, when I came out of the vision. You asked me something that I didn't answer. You said there was a part of it that you won't share. Oh, yeah, sure. That's easy to answer because it was for me. <laughs> it's very simple. It, it, was, it wasn't given to be shared. I was just made clear this is for you. Just like if you're in the Met and the curator is taking you around the museum, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want you to see the museum's porno collection and tell all your friends. So I'm not saying that this was anything pornographic. I'm just trying to be funny. I'm, I mean, there was something that uh, I, there were some things that I was shown that were, were clearly for me. And then the end part was not for, I mean, being shown it was for me, but I'm sharing it because there was no feeling that I, I shouldn't or can't share that. All there was was my sadness about it. And so earlier we talked about perhaps an event will come that will help change the trajectory we're currently on. But then it sounds like this, lack of a better word, vision indicates the opposite, that there's really nothing that's going to change it. Uh, can you ameliorate these differences? Is there in your headspace still a chance, a hope? Well, well I'm a stubborn MF, you know. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I persist in my... And look, maybe you could construe, if you spin it this way, that I was shown this to galvanize my work, that look, you know, if you're not successful in spreading these ideas well enough, and if you and others, of course, not just me, but if you and others can't get the world to wrap its mind around things as they really are and what needs to happen, then this is what we're looking at. And we didn't get that far because you know, I woke up and I woke up agitated because I, I felt strongly about it. Well, I mean, it's it's a strong not coincidence to me that you'd already written Bad Monk Manifesto. Isn't the message of that novel essentially, hey, guys, listen up. This is bad. <laughs> yeah, that's not that one isn't a novel. That's a, it's, a, it's a manifesto. By the way, you made reference earlier to something that's stuck in, in my crawl a little bit about memoir and autobiography. I, I didn't choose to call it a memoir. No, no, I figured your editor or publisher did. Yeah, well, but, but I mean, it is a memoir. And memoir and autobiography are not the same thing. No, I don't believe they are. I did not write an autobiography there. If I wrote an autobiography, I would have to deal, detail, you know, many things in my life. Uh, my kids, my, my kid, my marriage, my, my early experiences, uh, family dynamics, um, things that happened in jobs. And there's a thousand 10,000 things that I didn't put in that book because this book had a theme. If you have a theme and you write, you address your life experience through the lens of that theme, focusing on that theme, that to my understanding is a memoir. So that's why people can write multiple memoirs if they're good and successful commercially, you know, memoirists uh, that, you know, uh, about famous ballet dancer, you know, can write about the sexual abuse in her, in her life and her career. She can also write about the details of dancing and how to become one with the air. I mean, you know, those could be different memoirs, but they're not autobiographies because they're not just about her life. They're not her life in total. I do agree with you completely. And the reason the term sticks in my craw is that uh, when I was getting my MFA, we had a special memoir program and a lot of the professors were saying, you can flub the details, you can go left when you're supposed to go right. And I want my my audience to be very clear that I don't think you're flubbing the details in in your most recent memoir. And, and what you said is entirely true. So I think that's why I get really bogged down with that term. I see. Okay, good. That's a, that's a very interesting and worthy point. Thank you for that. I feel like there, there's nothing that I either mischaracterized or exaggerated uh, or made up in, in the memoir. There are you know, names were changed, of course, but the substance of what happened and what I described is not fiction. It's nonfiction. And before we wrap up the interview, because I am going to let you have the floor at the very end, as I give all my guests, um, I do want to mention for people listening that not only do I wholeheartedly endorse buying this thrilling memoir, as I call it, but um, I didn't get to ask on purpose about Probably my favorite part, which is um, when you're in a, a prison, huge air quotes, because <laughs> it's not in a formal prison, but uh, you were traveling in a foreign country. And so I just wanted to tease that for our audience and uh, mention that 
this is um it's truly an extraordinary tale of how if you just go down the path of your nature you'll get where you're going yeah there's um had some rough things happen in my life i i did have I was incarcerated in a foreign country for a few days, and it was on account of not allowing a drunken policeman to assault a woman in the street. Uh, I won't give any more detail than that, but, you know, I was pursued and apprehended, and both the woman and I were taken to a very bad place, and very, very bad things happened to both of us. And that's in the memoir, not to be salacious, but to indicate the starting point of my interest in learning how to hit a guy so he stays down if that's what has to happen right? uh and and my the martial side of my journey which has been you know the backbone of things for a while decades you know i guess the next milestone if i get there will be a half century of that you know that that was an important turning point in my life so i didn't i, I neither sugarcoated it nor, nor did i flesh it out in all of its lurid ghastly detail no, I thought you painted it perfectly. And for a reader like me, it's one of my worst nightmares. And it was helpful for me because I have a sense of ethics and a temper. And that's a dangerous combination, <laughs> especially in a foreign country. Right. And, you know, the temper thing, one, one thing I'll say about anger, I guess, which has, you know, my, my temper was, was never, you know, for the first 40 years of my life anyway, uh, my best characteristic. I, I wasn't a crazy hothead, but and I had a very long fuse. But once it started, you know, things were not going to end in a good place. I, I'm not, listen, I'm, I'm not in any way proud of that. It's just it's another thing that needed to be, you know, to be helped and balanced. Uh, and, and it has been. I really don't get mad at anything very much anymore. I can get other things, get annoyed, irritated, impatient, disappointed, but not really angry. Maybe I just don't have the, achieve for that anymore to explode physically like that but you know in that case uh, of, of what happened with my eventual incarceration i i can't say that i would do it any different if it was me now i'd do the same thing because there's, there's no alternative it wasn't because i was a hothead it was because i was witnessing a terrible thing it didn't have anything to do with me at all no and i think that's um a lot of my my attraction to your work is that it's compelling to meet someone who keeps persisting in the pursuit of their truth and who has landed in a position to relate it to an audience. That's why I appreciate Duncan Trussell is he's a comedian who cracks me up left and right, but he usually features special people like you on his, on his podcast. So, you know, I'm a, a full subscriber and everything and, and I really learn a lot and so to meet you in person now has just been uh, nothing but a pleasure and uh you're also your sense of humor which i read and understood it really comes alive in person so it's, it's cool to to see that humor is a part of taoism i think you, you have to be able to relax for a lot of physical and mental things to happen and humor is a, is a great relaxing agent you know you let down fences and release muscle tension when you laugh it's a very healthy thing to do on a, on one level at least. I can't thank you enough. It's been a total pleasure to meet you and to interview you. And uh, I know your time is precious, but you gave me a lot of it and I'm just so, so thankful for it. If you have any last message for our audience and then I'll take us out after that. Yeah, so, you know, the message is it's not all about us. I am so distraught despite seeking emotional and intellectual equilibrium and, and mostly finding it. Uh, as part of my practice, it's kind of the monk's job, you know. But it doesn't, you know, there's nothing in Taoism that is disconnected, disassociated, non judgmental, non this and that. It's not antiseptic. It's not a philosophy that stands apart and above. It, it's, and, you know, when I talk about wanting to, you know, achieve a level of awareness and understanding, that doesn't mean that I, want no longer to be engaged. If I were a Buddhist, we would say this is a discussion about the difference between an arhat and a bodhisattva. That's a, that's a whole other conversation. But And it has split the camp of, of Buddhism around the world for thousands of years. It's complicated. But in any case, you know, I would say that I moved to the place I live now. Obviously, the elephant in the room is I got, I got this illness, but... Um, I, I couldn't have foreseen that, I don't think. At least I didn't. Uh, I moved here because I wanted to be more in nature than in the hot New York angry frenzy of violence that South Florida, uh, where I lived for a long time. Long time. So now I'm 
in a quiet house. So, you know, I see what's going on in the development and the aridification and the climate change. And, you know, it's been, as you well know, because you get it worse down in Phoenix. But, you know, the answer is it's not all about us, us being the human race. But there's much, much more going on. There is a vast amount of wisdom and intelligence and depth in the minds of other creatures on this planet who are not human. I've had the privilege of looking a blue whale in the eye from 20 inches away. Um, and I've seen you no know, galaxies in that eye. But we, we are neither the smartest, nor the best, nor the only living creature on this planet. And the hubris that has gone on with our religions and philosophies has created a real honest to goodness catastrophe. And that makes me very sad. So uh, if I have a message, it's please try to live a life of compassion and frugality and humility. Think when you shop, when you're brushing your teeth, turn off the water. It doesn't need to be going down your drain just because you're standing near the sink. There's a zillion little things like that. Don't make your house a refrigerator and then put on sweaters in summer, right? I mean, it's just so many simple things that are seem small, but collectively, cumulatively, over billions of people would actually make a significant difference. Don't, don't eat animals if you can possibly avoid it. And if you need to for medical reasons, do so sparingly and, and with consciousness. There's a thousand other things down this line, but for that I recommend reading Mad Monk Manifesto, which is the bitter herb right up the nose without any sweetness to it. You, you may really dislike me or really like me after the end of it because of my ideas but you won't be uh, unaffected by it. And the memoir, if you, if you like memoirs and want to learn more about my personal journey, uh, The Monk of Park Avenue, maybe the, the book that I think is my best work of the last few years is one we didn't discuss, but it's called Turtle Planet. And I, I just think I did a literary thing there that has not been done before. And I, I feel like I did it as well as I could do it. A lot of people have liked it. It's also gotten some nominations for things. So anyway... It's a good book. In my fiction, in a few weeks, I have um, a new novel coming out called Wasp Warrior, uh, which is uh, about love and reincarnation in ancient China and modern day L.A. It's pretty fun. It's got a serial killer in it as the protagonist, but but a very, I, I hope, identifiable and you, you can kind of love her even though you see some things she does that you might not like, but you understand why. So Wasp Warrior is releases in a few days, I think. I um, should find it on Amazon. So anyway, books, books are my main thing. I teach classes and online and, and here in, in Tucson. All, ours, all of that is detailed on my website, which is just my name, com. And interviews like this are also available there, website and class schedules and workshops and things I'm doing. There's going to be a workshop in October, which you might yourself like to attend. So there's always something going on, as long as I'm able to sustain it. Thank you, Monk Yun Ro. And for everyone who's listening at home, you can best support us by subscribing to the show and heading over to MikeyOp.com and subscribing for free to the package that comes through that. But also, please check out Monk's website and his prolific career. And there's so much to do on that site. And thank you to my audience. And my name is Mike Oppenheim, and I will see you soon. <laughs>